so I've been asked to speak about whether air emissions or our emissions from the gas industry associated with hospitalization in Darling Downs. And so first I'd look at one international slide that Helen has already touched upon uh, on asthma. And this was of 35,000 medical records of people in Pennsylvania. And the outcome was that those who lived beside a higher number or larger gas wells were between 1.5 and four times more likely to have asthma attacks with those who lived closest having the highest risk. And of importance was that the risk of asthma attacks were raised throughout all stages of well development, from pad preparation through drilling, stimulation, and production. So we're back to the Darling Downs. Remember this date, 5th of January, 2015. That's the day the first LNG tanker sailed from Gladstone. What that meant was that there was a fully functioning gas field. It had been built involving massive land clearance, soil disturbance, construction and industrialization. Appia, who is um, the peak body for the industry, these are their statistics, that at that time in Queensland there was a total of over 6,500 active coal seam gas wells, over 5,000 production wells, 1,500 exploration wells, and 427 wells in Queensland had been fracked. So there were wells, rigs. This is in the state forest. There was a total of 5,000 kilometers of transmission pipelines at that stage. And this is the state forest when they'd finished with it. Land clearance, these massive pipes. There were pipelines, and this is not photoshopped. Pipes hundreds of kilometers of high voltage overhead power lines, and these were for the sole and express use of the gas industry. There were pits and ponds and more ponds, reinjection wells, flares, more flares, lots of infrastructure, processing plants. This is the central processing plant, Ruby Joe, compressor stations, more compressor stations and more. Water treatment plants, this is Kenya. Origin reverse osmosis plant, associated water amendment facilities, and the power stations which were built for them, Condamine Power Station and Bremer. Hundreds of kilometers of access roads, massive truck movements, and what was missing? Air monitoring. The first government air monitoring station was sited at Hopeland near Chinchilla in February 2015. And this was five years after the LNG production license were issued and one month after completion of the fully functioning gas field. The ship had literally sailed. However, residents of Queensland gas fields had been reporting health impacts to Queensland Health since 2008 from the exploration phase. And these reported health impacts included eye irritation, skin irritation, rashes, nosebleeds, cough, chest tightness, muscle spasms, headaches, numbness, pins and needles, severe stress, fatigue. And the Queensland government claimed that they had conducted a comprehensive health study. In fact, this is an extract from a letter that came from the office of Minister Lynham, who was the Minister for Mines, and was sent to several people. And it said, in 2013, Queensland Health conducted a comprehensive study into the potential health effects of coal seam gas in the Tara region. However, unfortunately, it was simply not true. As has become really apparent this year, there was a study by Claudio et al, which analysed the Queensland Health 2013 um, report and found it, as Helen has said, had it failed to meet health international best practice for health impact assessment because not seven out of nine key steps were omitted. And in a question in response to me, Dr Jeanette Young from Queensland Health um, replied that in fact they had undertaken step one, screening available data to determine if a health impact assessment needed to be undertaken. And Syro Desira um, published a study design framework this year for a potential um, study. And what they found was that an in-depth health impact study has yet to be conducted in an Australian coal seam gas region. 
So, in the absence of air monitors during gas field construction, is there any publicly available data? And there is, but it has got limitations. There's data from the National Pollutant Inventory, who ab above a defined threshold, polluting industries throughout Australia are required to self-report their calculated total annual estimates of emissions to air of 93 toxic substances. Now, these 93 toxic substances are identified as important owing to their possible health effect on human health and the environment. And um, this is a map, a Google map of um, the gas fields in the um, Darling Downs with the gas industry emission reporting sites for the National Pollutant Inventory. And you can see that on this map, Toowoomba's over to the east, Tarum up to the north, Stanthorpe and Gundawindi down in the bottom, and Chinchilla in the middle. And the yellow triangles are um, wells, and the flames are the reporting emission sites. And I published a paper in January this year, um, and part of what I did was compiled the national pollutant data of these self-reported emissions, so these acknowledged emissions um, for four companies who operated within um, the Darling Downs Health and Hospital um, catchment, and that was QGC, Origin, Santos and Arrow. And as you can see, that uh, the, the data that I've received on health was um, contained in the bulk of these years, there's a couple of years before I've got the health data and one year after. But you can see that for some things, they did not report any of these air toxins and they escalated right year by year as, as it went on. The air toxins acknowledged by the coal seam gas industry are known to cause respiratory and, and, and cir circulatory problems and these emissions escalated. Um, for example, they, they acknowledge that their emissions of oxides of nitrogen, including nitrogen dioxide, increased nearly 500% to over 10,000 um, tonnes. And this is important because oxides of nitrogen are irritant. They dissolve in moist tissues, whether that is the no eyes, the nose, the throat, the lungs, um, to produce nitric acid, which irritates and burns. This triggers asthma is known to cause deficits in children's lung function as associated with emergency visits and hospitalization. They acknowledged, the coal seam gas industry acknowledged that particulate matter, PM10, um, escalated over 6,000% and PM2.5 increased from zero, zero to 301 tonnes. Particulate matter is really important. The, the World Health Organization um, tells us that there is no safe level of particulate matter. This is the tiny, tiny particles. They are so small, you cannot see them with the naked eye. And these very small particles cross directly from the lungs into the bloodstream. And the damage that they cause depends on the organ they end up on. So PM2.5 is a cause of cardiovascular illness and death. It is linked to childhood respiratory disease, to adverse birth outcomes to atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries. Their new studies show quite clearly the increased risk of diabetes. Um, a recently published um, um, paper showed that there was escalating risk of diabetes with PM2.5 as low as 2.4 micrograms per meter cubed. It's associated with dementia, with Parkinson's, and for um, respiratory health, the coarse particulate matter is just as important as, as the fine particles. Um, the air quality criteria for Australia is inadequate. Um, the PM2.5 annual average criteria is 8 micrograms per metre cube, which is tending, trending to 7 by 2025. And the 24-hour average is, is 25, trending to 20 by 2025. The important thing again about particulate matter is it can be the cause of chronic disease, but peaks of PM can actually trigger heart attacks and strokes. Carbon monoxide is really important. It, in high volumes, is a chemical asphyxiant, but in people with pre-existing heart disease, it can significantly increase um, 
arrhythmias and angina, and this at, is at near ambient levels. Volatile organic compounds is a mixed bag, including the BTEX chemicals, um, and has got widespread um, potential effects, including irritation, um, organ damage, and some VOCs are known human carcinogens. Sulfur dioxide, also an irritant, um, um, associated with heart and lung damage, and it was increased by more than a thousand percent. Formaldehyde, really important, it is a significant toxin, and it increased from 12 kilograms to 160 tonnes. It's a sensory irritant, it causes burning sensation in the eyes, nose, throat, coughing and wheezing, it's associated with the allergy and respiratory symptoms in children, and of real importance, it is a known human carcinogen, and it is associated with myeloid leukaemia and nasopharyngeal and sinonasal cancer. Ozone is not a primary air toxin, it's caused by a chemical reaction between oxides of nitrogen and volatile organic compounds in sunlight, of which, of course, there's a lot in Australia. And it is associated with airways inflammation, decreased lung function, and asthma admissions. So this pictorially is what happened to um, the air toxins from 2005-06 to 2014-15. Again, this is PM2.5 and formaldehyde on this chart, and you can note that um, from 2010 onwards, when um, the permissions for the um, major projects were given, there was a major escalation. So then the question is, what data is available about the health of the Darling Downs residents during construction of the gas field? This is a map of um, the Western Downs, which is the catchment area for the Darling Downs Hospital and Health Service. And again, you can see Toowoomba over the, up to the right, Tarum up in the north, Gundawindi and um, Stanthorpe in the south with Chinchilla in the middle. Um, and I was given um, hospitalisation data directly by the Darling Downs Hospital and Health Services. and. Um, this, I found that um, the results were quite startling. The, from between 2007 and 2014, the population of the Darling Downs increased by 9.4%. And at the same time during those years, hospitalisation of residents of the area for acute respiratory conditions increased by 142% and hospitalisation of residents for acute circulatory conditions increased by 133%. And this is um, the data from the hospitals and a picture of how it relates to with population change. So essentially, each of them more than doubled over this time frame. So essentially, cardiopulmonary hospitalisations rose coincident with the rise in pollutants known to cause such symptoms. So then the question then, that was um, during construction of the gas field with the data going up to 2015, and um, the air monitoring started in 2015, and maybe it's better now, or is it? There's now five ambient air monitoring stations in the gas field, and um, there is some data post-construction, and in fact, there is a recent CSIRO report which is this one. Um, they note in that report that there are some significant spikes in air pollution. Um, this is um, data taken from the website, sort of, and you can see that in Hopeland, between the 3rd and 8th of December 2016, there was a major spike in PM2.5, up to nearly 200. Remember, diabetes, the risk starts at 2.4. CRO's assessment of that major spike was that it was due to bushfires. And that, in fact, seems quite reasonable on the evidence that they produced. Um, landhold, and this is directly from the report, landholders nearby reported smoke. They found satellite images of hot spots um, on the 5th and 6th of December in fires which were 50 to 60 kilometres north-northwest of Hopeland, and the direction of the wind was appropriate. Um, and the particles were fine fraction and it correlated with the carbon monoxide levels. 
and this is the satellite images that they um, produced in the CSIRO report, and you can see chinchilla with the um, uh, hotspots, the two red um, areas to the north of it, northwest. So I investigated a little bit further and went to the Queensland government website um, for um, emergency services and in fact found this from their newsroom on the 6th of December 2016 that there was a large vegetation fire burning in the vicinity of L Tree Creek Road and Barracoola State Forest, Kalgoorlin. Um, now, I didn't know where Kalgoorlin was, so I went to Google Maps to find it, and there it is right in the middle. And I followed L Tree Creek Road on Google Maps northwards towards the Barracoola Forest and went a little bit north, nothing much to see, nothing much to see, nothing much to see. And then there was this, the Origin APLNG Pipeline Hub at L Tree Creek Road, Barracoola State Forest. What was really disappointing to me was in the CIRO report, they failed to, to even mention this major gas infrastructure in the vicinity of a bushfire. And this is, was a bushfire significant enough to cause a major peak of PM 2.5 more than 50 kilometers away. So I looked at a couple more of the um, incidents that they reported in the CIRO report. On the 11th of August 2016, um, there was another major spike at Hopeland. The 24-hour av average PM 2.5 was 55.8 with a peak of 360. And CIRO again attributed the cause to local bushfires and cited fires 10 kilometres southwest and 50 kilometres north of Hopeland. And that was exactly the same attribution that they'd given in the um, 6th of December on, on their chart. But when I went to correlate that with the um, government website and the local media, and there had been local media about the previous ones, there was no reports of fires on the government website that I could find, and there was no reports that I could find in the media, and there was no satellite images that they put in their report. So I was wondering what might be happening. So um, this, the raw data has, was only actually released and put on the website Thursday last week. And I took some out and, and charted it and found this, that they, the one hour average data didn't show the peak of 360. You can see the one hour av average is just coming up to 250. But what I found really curious about this was the time frame, because um, I'd, this has started at 1 a.m. And so, in fact, this peak was starting at 2,300 hours and going all night and then gone again in the morning. So I went to some more raw data on the government website for different time, different place. This was Hopeland. The last two examples were Hopeland. So I went to the miles data for 2015. This was, um, I haven't looked at everything. I just picked another, another place. And I found that there was something curious going on here. PM 2.5 spikes in the middle of the night on miles on the 15th of September, so at midnight onwards. And on the 16th of September 2015, spike at 3 a.m. And on the 4th of November, all night. And at 13th of November, major spike at 4 a.m. But CSIRO, in their report failed to mention this trend of nighttime air pollution. They did, however, mention a re regional ozone event. Um, and this, um, they, they found that everywhere that they measured on this particular day on 22nd of December 2016, the four hour average concentration was more than 80% of the air quality objective. And as we know, ozone requires the presence of the re precursors, the volatile organic compounds, the nitrogen oxides, and of course, sunlight. But curiously, Cyrus' conclusion was the source unknown. This is a quote from Cyro about methane. Methane is considered non-toxic and only poses a risk to human health when at very high concentrations, where it can act as an asphyxiant or explosive hazard. Consequently, there are no ambient air quality objectives for methane, which certainly is true. 
that it poses um, a risk to human health at high concentration as an asphyxiant or an explosive hazard. However, partial oxidation, partial oxidation of methane in sunlight or by combustion forms formaldehyde, that potent toxin. Methane emissions are coincident with the release of other noxious chemicals. Um, and in this gas field, methane emissions, both fugitive and planned, are unmeasured and they're unmonitored. And for CSIRO to dismiss methane as a risk to human health, I think, is unacceptable. So my thoughts on going through the CSIRO report was, um, it was meant to be an analysis of ambient air quality in a gas field, but there was no scrutiny of the, acti of the activities of the industry which were coincident with the exceedances. There was no discussion or analysis of possible industry-related causes of impaired air quality. And I don't know if you remember Faulty Towers, but it re reminded me of the one about don't mention the war. There are other ongoing serious data gaps. There is still no exposure monitoring. There is no account of spatial and temporal conditions. There is no account of mixtures of toxins. There is no monitoring of the cumulative load of low volume, highly toxic pollutants like the BTEX, phenol, PAH, alkanes, heavy metals, or radon. And no one is considering the risk from silica. An example of why one might need exposure monitoring. This is a um, situation of one family. They have 29 gas wells within a two kilometer radius. However, the nearest ambient air monitor is almost seven kilometers away. And as well as the 29 gas wells, there's at least 70 other emission sources within two kilometers, which are engineered to vent and emit gas. This, the black spot in the middle is the family surrounded. And the emission sources, apart from the wells, are the high point vents, the hydraulic power units, the vents on the water pipe at the well, the vents on the water outlet and the risers. So my conclusion is that the burden of air pollution from the gas industry on the well-being of the Darling Downs population is a significant public health concern. And an in-depth health impact study has yet to be conducted in an Australian coal seam gas region. However, there is some prospect for future health studies. For example, Jazeera um, have announced this year that they have a planned health project which will last two years. And their stated aim of this project is to determine whether there are hazards with viable causal pathways that may result in impacts on human health. What they plan to do is the scoping, the identification and screening. They have no plans to do an in-depth exposure and risk assessment or health outcome assessment. And they don't plan to come to any conclusion or advice on future management. Jazeera, um, in their stated aims, say they are looking for pathways, but they are actively excluding gas-fired power stations, even though the gas-fired power stations were built specifically for the project and um, or for the use of the project. They just era are looking for pathways but excluding underground coal, coal gasification, even though then Hopeland they plan to drill hundreds of wells into the same coal seam um, that has already been contaminated by underground gasification. And Jazeera are looking for pathways, but they're actively excluding coal mining, even though under beneficial usage, um, process water is used for washing coal. So effectively, by 2020, two years later, there would still be no health outcomes. So it's not in my brief, I'm meant to be talking about air emissions, but I'll leave you with a couple of pictorial thoughts. Water. Reverse osmosis water is used, um, is pumped by the gas industry into the Chinchilla Weir, which is the town water supply of Chinchilla. And this is the outlet. And this is a tree in the weir after the water has dropped. And this is the bank of the weir after the water is dropped. The, 
on the white on the right side are birds. And this is the wall of the weir after the water has dropped. Thank you for listening.